Hi, welcome to Paradox One Experiment, uh, video number seven. Uh, this is like the third time I tried to restart this and something went wrong, either the microphone wasn't on or something, yada, yada, yada. I'm having difficulty getting this one to you. In this video, we're gonna discuss that the Paradox One Experiment needs to be broken down into three separate experiments to cover all the objectives that we talked about in the video on the Patreon side. So, what I've just by modeling the paradox one, I found a flaw in the logic of the experiment, and I won't go over that. So I'm not just going to discuss it here. We'll discuss it as we go on. In order to complete the desired objectives, which include showing the ambiguity in the classic flux model, and also to support the precision measurements for the edge current distribution that we talked about on the Patreon side, we need three variants of the paradox generator here. And we're going to just each of these is going to be one A, the one B, and the one C. This is a screen capture from the uh, from the modeling software that we did for the on the Patreon side. So the disagreement, okay. Just recovering or rehashing what the problem was. In classical electromagnetic theory, Okay, this is a motor that rotates a magnet, and these are conductive disks. In this case, we're only using the left side conductive disk. Because classical theory says, because the magnet and the disk rotate together, that there's no relative motion, that there cannot be any energy developed from the disk, and they contend that the rotating magnetic field couples with the closing path, and that's where the energy is created. In new electromagnetism, it says that the power is generated in the disks and this concept of there has to be relative motion between the disk and the magnet is baloney. Okay, so what we propose that in order to prove this idea that on, if we were able to double the number of disks and connect them together, well, that would prove one case or the other because the, connecting these two disks should not affect the closing path. Therefore, if the energy is developed in the closing path, then classical theory would be right. On the other hand, if you connect these two disks together and you get double the current, well, then that would prove that the energy is developed in the disk. The problem is when you actually run the numbers, the, the value comes out to be ambiguous. So here's the modeling. In this particular one here, this is the modeling for classical theory where the EMF is in the closing path. This loop here is a closing path. This is a disk, and this is the other disk, and this is the resistance of each disk, the resistance of the closing path, and this is the line here. So what we do is we run once with just one disk, and we compute the equations, and we connect these two and run the, run the numbering with the two disks in parallel. And then down here, this is the new electromagnetism version where the EMF is generated in the disks. Again, we run it once with one disk, and then we model it again with two disks in a parallel. And when you run the numbers, you get exactly identical answers. In other words, from an ammeter out here, or any kind of meter out here, you can't tell the difference between one disk on and two disks on the difference. So you cannot tell where the EMF is generated from a meter out here. Now, we had the same kind of problem with new induction. We couldn't tell the difference on a closed loop of wire using either the classical theory, which is a transverse electromagnetic field, or the new electromagnet, which has a spherical field. The reason for that is the closed loop uh, causes a constraint, which causes an ambiguity, and we were getting the same answer. No matter what we did, we couldn't just, just delineate between classical theory and new electromagnetic they both gave equally good answers. So this, we've had this problem before. This is not a big deal. We just got to figure out how to disambiguate. And in classical theory, for the new induction, we disambiguated by going to an open loop experiment, and they were able to disambiguate. And so we have to find a clever way to disambiguate in this case as well. Okay, and in order to disambiguate, there's a postulate of new electromagnetism that charge balance system. A charge balance system is a system that has equal number of positive and negative charges. A charge balance system would be a magnet because there's no net charge on a magnet. There's equal number of positive and negative charges. 
Okay, a current running in a wire is another charge balance system. So in order to disambiguate, we need to go to a charge unbalanced system. And we're going to discuss that. That's going to be the paradox 1C experiment. Okay, but in the meantime, before we get to there, one thing we can do is take advantage of new technology to reestablish the base experiments. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, because of neodymium magnets, we don't have to run these experiments at the high RPMs we had to in the previous days or high RPS rounds per second in order to make a meaningful measurement with a, D, a standard DMM. The new three inch neodymium magnets are like 10 times more powerful than the previous magnet. And so the slow speeds that we get out of a, you know, a little stepper motor, which is like four rounds per second, is able to generate voltages just in reach of a standard DMM, a few millivolts. Okay, but that then allows us to just go by a good precision DMM that can measure in millivolts or microvolts more accurately. And so what we're going to do for paradox 1A is we're actually, because we can use the stepper motors now, since we can get meaningful measurements with the slow speed of stepper motors, and because slow stepper motors, we can synchronize the motion of two things with the stepper motors, two separate stepper motors. We can synchronize the motion of a magnet and a disc. We can actually run the Faraday's final riddle experiment completely and run all the different modes. You know, the mode for mode zero where not, neither is turned, and obviously there won't be any voltage in the precision voltmeter. Or mode one, where we just run the disc and leave the magnet stationary. Or mode two, where we run the, 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 the magnet and keep the disc stationary. And, of course, mode three, where we run them both at the same speed. And with a stepper motor, we'll be able to match speeds between the two very precisely, which we couldn't have done before in the older days where I was building this because we had open loop motors and it was a pain in the butt. And that's why we mounted the disc and the magnet on the one shaft. So paradox 1A is going to be the experiment to um, reassert all of the modes of Faraday's final riddle. And we'll be using a Siglent uh, precision. We're gonna pre-purchase it. We're gonna talk about this in a little bit. Paradox 1B, Okay, we're going to use brushes against a single spinning magnet, and we're going to use an actuator to move the brush so that we can quantify the edge current. Because as we discussed on the Patreon side, um, our physics software treats the edge current as one filamentary thin wire of, let's say, 14,000 amps that goes around the center of the magnet, this being the north side and the south side of the disk magnet. And that's great when you're far enough away, but when you get up real close and you want to work right at the edge, it's better to have a good high precision current distribution so you can get a very accurate simulation result so that you can match your experimental result with your simulation result to be confident that you're not missing anything. And that's the number one purpose here is to make sure that we're not missing anything in the experiment, that there's no terms of magnetism that we need, still need to account for. We want to verify that. That's one of the reasons here. And then the paradox 1C, which is going to be the minor objective is to invalidate the classic flux model, the B-field model. And for that, we have to go to a charge and balance system. And for that, we will use a Crookes tube, a Crook tube. I believe there's an E in here. And so what a Crookes tube is, it's an electron beam that's, that goes against a, a uh, screen over here. And you can see the beam deflecting from a magnetic field. Now, in this configuration here, this is a cut and, you know, this is clip art. In this configuration here, the beam will actually, instead of bending toward the stepper motor, is actually going to bend up out of the page or down into the page. And that's going to interfere with our ability to measure. So what we're going to do is compensate that up or down deflection with another magnet that will compensate and allow this beam to go straight across. Okay, and here's our system that we're using here. So what we're going to do by putting this other magnet here is cancel any Z deflection. Therefore, then when we turn this stepper motor on, we should see the beam actually deflect in the Y or negative Y direction. And I can show you the reason why using the right hand rule. I can't do that now because I'm using this um, PowerPoint type thing to make the video. And so if now what may happen because the magnet isn't perfect and maybe it's not mounted perfect, may wobble still a little bit. There may be a little bit of wobble. But as long as it pretty much stays straight, except for a little bit of wobble, 
then that would mean the classical theory is wrong. Because according to classical theory, if I spin this magnet, it should turn up or turn down depending on the direction of this magnet. New electromagnetism says this beam will not be deflected, except for a little wobble due to imperfections in the magnet. Okay, so that's going to be paradox 1c, which will finally put to rest that the new electromagnetism model of magnetism is superior to classical theory. So don't be discouraged. This, this is normal. Mother Nature is an expert at clouding her secrets in ambiguity. Okay, and if they were easy, these discoveries would have been made by someone playing with magnets on their kitchen table. Now, let me give you the example of Galileo. It's not a case where, you know, he made some measurements from his telescope and all of a sudden, voila, we now know that the Earth revolves around this or evolves or rotates. Or what's right? I don't know if the right way around the sun. No, he had to go and push the boundaries of science. He had to revolutionize astrological measurement techniques, the tools like to improve the telescope and had to improve the mathematics for the analysis of the data. That's why he's known as a polymath. Same, and a lot of developments in science and engineering require more than one invention to bring to fruition. For example, Edison's light bulb. The light bulb, he didn't really invent the light bulb, he invented a more practical light bulb. But to get it into the market, he had developed the power meter, the generator, the distribution network. Um, and then, of course, Nikola Tesla's idea of AC overbeat that. But the point being that you just can't bring a light bulb into being and say, aha, and I can go sell it to everybody. You have to provide the means where they can use it. Same with the airplane. The Wright brothers didn't just invent the airplane. They had to invent the aerofoil. They had to invent a lightweight engine. They had to invent a means to pilot it. Um, they had a lot of inventions just to make the airplane work. And an airplane is a conglomeration of pushing the technology in a lot of different directions. They had to develop wind tunnels so they can get accurate measurements so they'd know if their stuff worked or not. So it's not a case that somebody working on their on their dining room table is going to develop something new. They usually have to push technology in many different directions to make developments. Okay, so don't worry. These things are normal. We just have to deal with it and do our due diligence, yada, yada, yada. Now, I thank to the Patreon subscribers because we're acquiring a Microvolt sensitive DMM, a Siglent SDM 3050. I'm taking a chance on this. Okay, my normal instinct is to go by the Agilent um, because when you do scientific work and Agilent says it's this, then nobody questions the instrument. So I'm trying to do this because it's less expensive. It's about a third the price of the Agilent. And we're going to do a full evaluation review video that will be on the YouTube site. Um, and we're going to put it through the test to see if it, it does what it says it can do. If it's if it's the case, then I'm saying, hey, for a third of the price, I'm getting the value there. Uh, if it doesn't, well, I'm going to have to buck up and put up the money for the Agilent or the eSight. Anyway, thank you. Thank for my Patreon subscribers. I appreciate you all. And the people that have been with me for 20 years, I, I appreciate. Thank you very much.